Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Authority. I'm Joseph Pierce. Thanks, as always, for joining me. And this week, um, we are looking at one of the most famous authors uh, in any language um, of any time, and that's Charles Dickens. It, certainly within the English-speaking world, it, I think it's probably fairly safe to say that he's the most popular author after William Shakespeare. Um, so we're dealing with a, 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 not just a literary giant uh, in this episode, but a literary colossus, shall we say. Um, I, I know that a few years back, and of course, you know, these things may change, but a few years back, it was generally agreed that the um, the, the the biggest selling highest selling works of literature of all time um, was um, probably uh, Don Quixote by Miguel Cervantes, the classic of Spanish literature, of course. Um, and then um, a, a Tale of Two Cities by, um, by Charles Dickens. And what's interesting about that, of course, is that Dickens has written more than one novel, the fact that even one of them could be up, could be up there that high. So that's the best selling, but probably the most influential is not even that, even though that's the best selling, the most influential is probably A Christmas Carol, you know, the story of Scrooge and his conversion, which we'll be talking about uh, in this episode uh, somewhat. Um, and then, uh, I, so that, w there's something between what's the best selling and the best, is it necessarily the same thing? So for instance, um, in the 1990s, there's an organization in, in England called the Bibliophile Society. And as the, as the title, uh, the name of the group would, suge would suggest, it's a society of bibliophiles. In other words, a society of those who love books, a book-loving society. So these are bookworms. So they were asked what was the greatest work of literature of all time. Um, and um, first was, I'm pleased to say, The Lord of the Rings. Um, by Tolkien. Second was Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. I'm also very happy for that. But third, uh, they actually voted um, David Copperfield. So again, a third novel, best-selling, best, best um, most influential. And they get different names coming up. And we haven't mentioned Oliver Twist and numerous others that we, we could mention uh, that, that, that all have, have, have uh, really impacted the culture. So there's something really phenomenal and phenomenally successful about Charles Dickens. Well, what is the secret of his success? Well, I would I would claim that the key thing about it is the the dignity of the human person. That Charles Dickens clearly loves people, not humanity and not some abstract concept. Um, he's not a philanthropist, a lover of humanity. Um, he is a lover of men, a lover of people. And, this, the, and he sees the dignity of the human person, which is really to see that the, the, the imago dei, right, the image of God, the person of Christ in every human face and every human person that we interact with. I think we see that in Charles Dickens, this, this great love and reverence and deference for the dignity of the human person. And specifically, he has a great love of the poor. Um, obviously, something very fundamentally Christian about that. Um, but you just read the gospel. A love of the poor and a really deep love of children. And again, something very Christ-like about that. Uh, unless you become like little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So, the, so in some sense, although Dickens was something of a uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? A quirky um, Christian. Uh, certainly was a Christian, but on his own terms. Um, so he doesn't fit uh, into any denomination very neatly. Uh, but there's no doubt that he had a love of Christ and a love of neighbor. Uh, and these are the two, the two great commandments, of course. 
rooted, as I've said, in the dignity of a person and a special love for the poor and for children. Throughout the authority, we have quoted the great G.K. Chesterton, who seems to have so much to say on just about everything. And he certainly has a great deal to say on Charles Dickens. He wrote a book called Charles Dickens, a book, a sort of a sort of biography, certainly an appraisal and an appreciation um, of of Charles Dickens. And he also um, introduced, uh, wrote an introduction, I think, for all of Dickens's work, which were also assembled together in in a book. So if you want to know what Chesterton thinks about Dickens, there are two whole books you can read on the t- topic. But I'm going to select just one passage here. Chesterton emphasized that Dickens, Dickens wanted what the people wanted because he was at one with the common mind. And let's read what Chesterton says here. This is all a, all a quote from Chesterton. But with this mere phrase, the common mind, we collide with a current error. Commonness and the common mind are now generally spoken of as meaning in some manner inferiority and the inferior mind. The mind of the mere mob. But the common mind means the mind of all the artists and heroes, or else it would not be common. Plato had the common mind. Dante had the common mind, or that mind was not common. Commonness means the quality common to the saint and the sinner, to the philosopher and the fool. And it was this that Dickens grasped and developed. In everybody, there is a certain thing that loves babies, that fears death, that likes sunlight. That thing enjoys Dickens. And when I say that everybody understands Dickens, I do not mean that he is suited to the untaught intelligence. I mean that he is so plain that even scholars can understand him. Um, nice barbed piece of humour at the end there. Um, even the critics can understand Dickens. So we have, as you know, my appraisal in a nutshell, so to speak, of uh, of the, the secret of Dickens' success, and we have probably somewhat more gravitas Chesterton's own uh, view on it. Let's now look at uh, a couple of his novels. We don't have a, a lot of time, um, but. Great Expectations, and, you know, in, in order to make sure, before I talk about it in my own uh, garbled, um, faltering way, um, I, I thought I would just, the, the opening paragraph of, uh, uh, I, edit, I edit a series of critical editions of great works of literature called the Ignatius Critical Editions, with 27 titles in that series and counting including uh, some Dickens novels, A Tale of Two Cities uh, uh, and Great Expectations. Are there others? I can't think at the moment. But in in many of those editions, we also have a study guide. And in the study guide, we have a section called Bare Bones, the Skeleton Plot. And I looked at this very succinct paragraph and I thought, well, I can't possibly encapsulate the, the skeleton plot uh, the bare bones of, of of great expectations better than this. So I'm going to just read this brief paragraph and then I'll elaborate about the, the novel beyond that. Great Expectations is a tale of one boy's journey from innocence to experience, from overzealous ambition to overwhelming repentance, from obsession with the external and temporal to devotion to the internal and eternal, to be loosed from the Victorian aspiration to become a gentleman and the accompanying bondage of his earthly chains. Pip must come to value goodness and truth over status and show. As Pip's Bildungsroman unfolds, we witness his guilt, remorse, confession, reparation, and absolution. Great Expectations is indeed a tale of a soul's Christian formation. Wish I knew who'd written that. Oh, <laughs> I've got a few ideas, but anyway, it's it's it's, it's a perfect encapsulation um, before we before we go further into it. So the key thing, well, so it's the story of Pip, 
Uh, it begins when he's a boy, ends when he's a man, and the various uh, mistakes he makes and, and looking at the reasons he makes them. But at the beginning of the of, of the novel, he's living with uh, his brother-in-law, uh, Joe Gargery, or Gargery, the blacksmith who's married to Mrs. Joe, as she's called, who's Pip's older sister. Now, whereas Mrs. Joe uh, is, has no real love lost for her younger brother, Joe Gargery really accepts some... Um, uh, Pip as a younger brother or even as a sort of son he's obviously somewhat older um, and he's simple he's uh, uneducated um, but he's kind uh, he has a, a, a genuine love not merely for Pip but for his neighbor in other words he's a good man a man of virtue a man of principle a man of integrity a man of honesty but he's simple and poor uneducated, unwealthy. There's another character who plays a role in the novel we should probably shouldn't overlook, and that's Biddy. And she's a simple girl who teaches Pip to read. So she's not as simple as Pip is at the beginning, but nonetheless, she, again, is someone who is poor, uh, simple, unrefined, um, uneducated beyond the ability to read. Uh, and not a high flyer in society, not ambitious. So these are good, positive role models at the beginning of Pip's life that he uh, rejects, and his love for them, his affection for them is poisoned. And it's poisoned by his association with the, uh, the, the two people who live at Sartis' house, and I can't help but thinking that that's a great sense of Dickensian humor here. Satis, the Latin word S-A-T-I-S, um, it means enough, uh, where we get satisfaction. Um, and the thing about Satis' house is that the occupants there, Miss Havisham and her niece Estella, uh, have enough uh, materially. Um, they, they can be satisfied as regards material prosperity um, they are comfortable uh, in this sense but they are morally destitute whereas of course Joe and Biddy are the opposite right? they do not have enough materially they are struggling financially and yet they are not morally destitute they're morally rich and so it's this what, what sort of wealth and what sort of health uh, what sort of wealth is healthy, should we say, is what is what Pip has to discover largely through making mistakes. So he falls in love, if that's the right word, becomes infatuated with uh, Estella. I mean, she's pretty, similar age, but she's a snob. Um, and she looks down her supercilious nose at Pip because of his poor um, background. Um, and she sees herself as being superior to him because of her wealth. And Pip falls for this. In other words, that he thinks somehow he'll be a better person if he's a wealthier person. And therefore, he becomes poisoned to the simple loves and simple pleasures of the poor and starts to seek um, worldly uh, rewards, uh, worldly wealth through worldly ambition. And this is the path he begins to take. Um, so he he becomes corrupt. And uh, again, without there's, there's other subplots, important subplots, um, Magwitch, for instance. Um, these are lots of good things going on in this novel, which we can't possibly encapsulate in the very little amount of time we have. Um, but as with most Dickens novels, there's a wonderful point of what Tolkien would call you catastrophe. So this is a word that Tolkien invented. It's the opposite to a catastrophe, the sudden disastrous downturn, bad turn in the story, a catastrophe, something that's catastrophic. Tolkien invented the word eucatastrophe, which is the sudden joyous turn in the story. And Dickens is a master at the sudden joyous turn, at the eucatastrophic turn, um, leading to the happy ending. In that sense, you know, that Dickens is, has a lot in common with fairy stories. And in the best sense of the word, um, so it ends with Pip's conversion to uh, to the the viewpoint of 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 the simple uh, and the holy, such as the blacksmith Joe, and his reconciliation with Joe at the end. He comes to his senses. 
All right, now, now let's look at the Tale of Two Cities. And I don't think that I can probably do better than than the few things I've written about it um, to encapsulate it. So that's what I'm going to do here. Again, the most popular in terms of sales. Published in 1858 and set in the two cities of London and Paris, hence the title, the novel covers the years from 1757 to 1794 against the backdrop of the revolutionary fervour in France. Dickens' principal historical source was the French Revolution of History by Thomas Carlyle, the revised edition of which was published in 1857, around the time that Dickens is writing the novel. Much of the action is centred on some of the most horrific moments of the French Revolution, such as the storming of the Bastille in July 1789, the September massacres of 1792, and the reign of terror in 1793 and 1794. At the broken heart of the novel is the pathetic presence of Sidney Carton, drunk and dejected, moody, and melancholy, who falls hopelessly in love with Lucy Manette. His love is literally hopeless and doomed to be unrequited because Lucy loves and marries the mysterious Frenchman uh, Charles or uh, Charles Darnay. The two men bear a remarkable physical likeness to each other, so that Carton is almost his rival's doppelganger. Carton confesses his love for Lucy, simultaneously confessing his own dissolute listlessness and unworthiness. He promises to love her, leave her in peace, think, thanking her for the joy she has given him, and then makes a prophetic promise which introduces the Christian theme of self-sacrificial love as the antidote to the world's arrogance, hatred, and spirit of vengeance. I would, I, he says, I would embrace my, any sacrifice for you and for those dear to you. So, and that's, of course, how the novel plays itself out. The difference between the self-sacrificial love and the arrogance and ignorance of self-empowerment, the, uh, the selfishness at the heart and the pride at the heart of the French Revolution, secular fundamentalism. Um, which leads to the, the, the guillotine in that case, and later to the gulag and to the gas chamber. The novel, of course, has one of the most memorable lines uh, in all of literature. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. But it also has, uh, at the end, one of the most famous and most beautiful quotes from literature in the, in the words that... Um, that Sidney Carton uses as he faces the guillotine. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It's a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. Ironically, but also divinely symmetrically, the book ends as it had begun with the imagery of resurrection from the dead. The first part of the book is entitled Recalled to Life, an allusion to the fact that Lucy's father, who was thought to be dead, had been discovered to be alive. At the novel's conclusion, the, dissolute, the dissolutely desolate Carton, the miserable good-for-nothing, is also recalled to life. This time, however, it is not merely a resurrection from death to life, like Lazarus, but a resurrection from death to everlasting life, like Christ. Seldom as a novel had a happier ending. And we'll move now to the d discussion of the, uh, the third of the, uh, of the three works of Dickens that, we'll, that, we'll, that we can look at in this episode of The Authority. So we've had great expectations. We've had a tale of two cities. We're now going to go to the one which is probably the most influential, and that's A Christmas Carol. And this really does have something of the mark of, um, of a fairy story about it. It's a novella as opposed to a novel. It's short. It's certainly very sweet. Uh, and um, for me, one of my favourite works of literature of all time. I love it for its simplicity and the profundity within its simplicity. So it's my favourite of all of Dickens' work. I'm not saying it's the greatest. I mean, it's slim. 
Um, it's brilliant, but obviously, obviously, it's it's not as complex, convoluted, um, st- uh, multi-layered, and structured as uh, as some of Dickens's other works. I think at root, one thing we love about it, it is a type of one of the best known of Christ's parables, the story of the prodigal son. It's a conversion story. It's, uh, we, we learn throughout the story of Scrooge's wandering away from the goodness of uh, his youth. There was absolutely suffering in, in, in amidst that, but there was also love, um, the, love of his, the love of his sister, the love of his fiance, uh, the love of his employers, some of his employers. Um, uh, but he turns his back on that in pursuit of gold, gold and greed, avarice. And then, of course, uh, it's the story of his return to Christ, uh, his return to the Father. So uh, thus we see Scrooge as a type of prodigal son. And that's certainly part of its timelessness is the fact that it taps into these timeless lessons um, uh, that, are, that are so powerful. And let, let's just say something very very, very, I think that we need to bear in mind here if you want to understand why the a Christmas carol is so powerful and why the parables of Christ are so powerful. That, and it also shows us why literature, great literature, is so powerful. Because I, I hope I'm not being too controversial when I state that um, the Prodigal Son is a work of fiction that uh, the prodigal son uh, as a real life historical character never lived, nor did his father, nor did his brother, nor did the servants, and nor did the pigs. Um, It's a figment of our Lord's imagination. It's a work of fiction. It's a work of uh, literature from when it's written down. Um, And yet, it's so true that whenever any of us, from the time that that story was first told in the gospel by Christ himself, to every time we've heard or read it, every generation since then, uh, we see the prodigal son and we see ourselves. Um, and we, we And we don't say the prodigal son is like us. We say we are like the prodigal son. Uh, in other words, that that somehow this fictional character is more real than we are because he's the type uh, of which we are the archetypes. Sorry, the, he's the archetype of which we are types. So he's the original and we are copies. Um, so what, what Christ does, first of all, in choosing to teach some of his most powerful lessons through the art of storytelling, he's sanctifying uh, and endorsing through that sanctification of the of the art of telling stories. But he's also showing how stories are the most powerful way of conveying truth. Of course, the, 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 the true story, the story of his own life, death, resurrection, ascension into heaven, that is itself a story. It's a story that happens as a fact in history, but other stories that can reflect that story. All right, so back to to uh, Christmas Carol. I want to go to the beginning of it. Uh, the story begins with the, the cold, hard fact that, that, that Scrooge's business partner, Jacob Marley, is as dead as a doornail. Quote, this is a quote from the story. There's no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be dis- distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. If we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking a stroll at night in an easterly wind upon his own ramparts than there would be in any other middle-aged gentleman rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. I think the connection here that Dickens draws with Hamlet and with the supernatural dimension of Hamlet is significant. Shakespeare in Hamlet and in Macbeth, and Macbeth is really an, an, an anti-Hamlet, it's what uh, Macbeth does, the, goes in the opposite direction to Hamlet. Hamlet starts in a place of despondency and desolation and ends up embracing the gospel and laying down his life for his friends and his country in an act of self-sacrificial love. Macbeth begins being lauded as a hero, 
and uh, then through uh, succumbing to worldly ambition, becomes a, a mass murderer uh, and a philosophical nihilist and suicidal. But what they have in common is uh, the supernatural uh, uh, engagement uh, in the story, uh, which is which is crucial, which tells us that the story itself is about supernatural realities, not merely natural realities. Hamlet's father has been murdered. Nobody would know that Hamlet's father had been murdered unless Hamlet's father had told <laughs> Hamlet, his son, that this was the case. Hamlet's not going to believe that because if all he knows that the, that, that the ghost could be a liar, a demon who's not really his father at all. So he tests it, uh, tests it empirically uh, and uh, proves that, uh, that, uh, that the ghost was telling the truth. So what Dickens does is exactly the same thing. He sets up at the beginning a supernatural reality at the outset and at the heart of the story that the story cannot be understood except supernaturally. And Marley, uh, I would I would suggest, is um, not a soul from hell, but a soul from purgatory. Now, why do I say that? He's clearly suffering. He's clearly suffering for his sins. But he's a penitential spirit. He's sorry for his sins. He's repentant. Uh, he wishes that he had done otherwise. He says that mankind was my business. So the love of neighbor was his business. Um, the, the, the doomed in hell have no sense of, uh, of repentance, uh, of uh, seeking the good of another. Aristotle says that the definition of love is seeking the good of another. Marley appears because he's seeking the good of Scrooge. He wants to save his business partner from the same fate that he is suffering. That's an act of love. The souls in hell do not act in love. So um, I would argue that Marley, like the ghost of Hamlet's father and the fact that, 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 that um, when he's introduced, Dickens introduces Hamlet's father, who states explicitly he's in purgatory, would suggest that Dickens had this in mind, but I can't prove that. But certainly theologically, that would seem to be inescapable. But if, if Marley is a, a, deceased, a deceased mortal suffering purgatorily for his sins, the, the the ghosts of Christmas past, uh, present, and yet to come um, are angels. Um, they're not mortals. They're not mortal men who have died, but they're supernatural beings who are sent as messengers. And Angelos, a, 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 Angelos, a, 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 Angelos, angel from the Greek means messenger. So the, the three ghosts are three angels and they're not angels in a general sense uh we could e we could even say that they are guardian angels because they're not showing for the most part at least they're not showing scrooge the the ghosts of christmas past so not, they're not, not they're not showing the ghost of christmas past doesn't show scrooge christmas past he shows scrooge the ghost he shows scrooge scrooge's christmas's past Right, they're, they're, it's the ghost of Scrooge's Christmas, and again, ghost of Christmas present. The, the for the most part, although he does show them other people, uh, these are people that Scrooge knows, and of course, the the, 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 um, the ghost of Christmas yet to come shows Scrooge ultimately his own destiny if he doesn't repent. Um, so I'm going to conclude with a conclusion uh, about a Christmas Carol. And again, I'm going to just read what I've written about it, this paragraph to conclude our discussion of Charles Dickens. The final aspect of A Christmas Carol, which warrants mention, especially in light of its poignant pertinence to our own meretricious times, is its celebration of life in general and the lives of large families in particular. The burgeoning family of Bob Cratchit in spite of its poverty, or dare we say, because of it, is the very hearth and home from which the warmth of life and love glows through the pages of Dickens's story. At the very heart of that hearth and home is the blessed life of the disabled child, Tiny Tim, which shines forth in Tiny Tim's love for others and in the love that his family has for him. His very presence 
is the light of Caritas that serves catalytically to bring Scrooge to his senses. After his conversion, Scrooge no longer sees the poor and disabled as being surplus to the needs of the population who should be allowed to die, as in our own day they are routinely killed or culled in the womb, but as a blessing to be cherished and praised. For this love of life, even of the life of the disabled, especially of the life of the disabled, is at the heart of everyone who knows the true spirit of Christmas as as exemplified in the helplessness of the babe of Bethlehem. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. And God bless you. Thanks for joining me in this episode of The Authority. Please do join me next time. And until next time, goodbye, God bless, and good reading. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.